Hey guys, we are back to discuss more of Genesis 2, starting with the rivers and continuing on. All right, so we're in Genesis 2. We looked at the first river, second river. We talked about how if you don't know Genesis 10, um, you really don't know where these areas are, and some of it we don't know anyway. But anyway, so let's look at, we looked at uh, Pishon, which had the gold. Um, and it's possible that's kind of the Yemen area. Then we had the second one, which was surrounding the land of Cush. Um, that could possibly be the Nile. Um, Cush is Ethiopia area. Then it says the name of the third river is, um, oh, I am on, excuse me, 2 verse 14. It says the third river is, I'm not even going to try. Yeah, it will. Hidekel. That's what mine says in Hebrew, kind of. Anyway, it says, and it is the one that goes toward the east of Asherah. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, here's what's interesting. Wait a minute. That's it? In verse 14, it gives two rivers. It says one, the one that goes toward the east of Asherah, right? And then, oh, yeah, and by the way, here's the fourth one, which is Euphrates. Well, when we hear Euphrates, we're like, oh, we know where that is. We don't really need to know anything else, which I love because it's kind of like as he goes from one to four, you get a lot of information, then a little bit, and then a little bit, and then just a name. Just a name. That's all we need to know. Every one of these rivers, I believe, again, will be significant in the end. We know the Euphrates is. I mean, in Revelation, we've got angels basically bound at the bottom of Euphrates. All right? I mean, you have armies marching across Euphrates. The other one is probably Tigris. Well, it doesn't say it, but uh, as sure, that's the area. That's These are all with, think about, the very fertile ground, right? You have Mesopotamia, you have Egypt, you have all the fertile ground, which is where all these rivers seem to be. I know that it is often speculated that the Garden of Eden was somewhere in Mesopotamia, somewhere in the Middle East Central area. Well, if Eden was um, the Jerusalem Israel area, then east of Eden would actually be um, the Mesopotamia area. So that's your Iraq, I you know your Iraq area, Iran, Jordan, all in there. Um, I know there's a lot of other nations there too, but. Uh, Yemen's in there. So too. it's very possible that that is um, that is the area that we would find the remnant after the flood of the um, Garden of Eden. Anyway, moving on. So let's go down to verse 15. It says, And Yahweh Elohim took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. Oh, he put him there to work it. Okay, I want to bring this up because I think it's so important. As believers, our job isn't to just sit and just la, 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 you know, meditate. Our job is to work it for the harvest. We have a job. He didn't create Adam to just hang out with him. He wasn't looking for, quote, drinking buddy. He wasn't looking for somebody to just play games with. He was looking for someone who would work with him. He was looking for someone who was going to be actively involved. Relationships require action. So he put him in the garden. Because he trusted man. He put him in the garden to guard, to work it and guard it. Remember at the beginning of chapter 2 when it says there was no man yet to guard, uh, excuse me, no man yet to work the field, right? To till it. Well, here we go. Now we have man. Man is given here. Adam's given the same authority with the words as God was because he shared in the creation to help him. He gave the creating power to man, all right? And so here he's put there to work, to guard it. You know, this actually, um, how do I want to say this? The guarding, why would you guard? What, what's the, what the heck, what are you guarding from? It's just Adam and Eve. Actually, right now it's just Adam and the animals, right? Eve hasn't been pulled out yet. But even then, because Eve is inside of Adam, when the command to guard, work it and guard it. It was given to both, he and she, as one. I know they often say, well, Adam, uh, Eve never heard this, only Adam was told it. It's possible. But what if, by being one in full oneness, 
Eve was aware of this information. So when she was pulled out, she still has that information. She's not missing. She understands how everything was created as well because they're one. So it's very possible that she also gets and receives the information that Adam has because of their oneness. Anyway, just a thought. So it says in 16, And Yovei Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eat of every tree of the garden, and do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, here we go. Don't eat of that one tree. That's the command. But do you notice that it's actually positive command first. It says, eat of every tree. Eat of every tree of the garden. Because remember, every tree is good to look at. It smells good. It's beautiful. Every tree. That means the tree of good and evil also looks great. Remember? Enemy comes in the, as an angel of light also. So it can't be like, oh, just don't touch the ugly one. That's not even desirable. No, it's among the desirable. All right. So the first commandment is to eat. Eat, be nourished. Partake in what I've given you. Because I've given it to you to strengthen you. So go on and eat. No limitations. Go on. Oh, except for this one. Right. Remember up at the top when it talked about what was in the midst of the garden? It said that in verse 9, in the middle of it, it says, With the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right. So he put both of these. But in the midst, in the Lord's eyes, he put in the midst the tree of life. That's God's reference point. The middle is the tree of life. And he tells them to eat of them all. That includes in the middle, the tree of life. They can go eat of that. But by the time we get to chapter 3, we'll see they haven't eaten of it yet. Okay? So they can eat of everything but that one, and in that day they'll die. Let's talk about this die. Death is separation. When Satan fell, he was separated that was he was separated from God never to return so death is a physical separation but it's also a spiritual separation there is uh, we don't really understand but we know that when yeshua when jesus is on the cross a part of the just painstaking taking on the sin for us death was the spiritual and physical separation the physical separation, not as much, but the spiritual separation from his father, whom he was one with, was beyond our ability to understand. It was agonizing. However, when we go back to first Adam and second Adam, first Adam literally experienced this. He experienced for him and Eve the separation, a spiritual separation pulling apart from the living God. He was a direct creation of the living God with the spirit in him that was shared with, with God. Yet at death, he was pulled apart. That was ripped out. He did it. He accepted that for him and Eve, the two of them. This is a great picture of Jesus. Because when Jesus died, he didn't die for him. He died for his bride. He died for his people. He took on their sin. He took that on. Adam takes it on too. However, he is sinful as well. So it's not like he's innocent just saving his wife. But we'll talk about that more. Anyway, so let's go back to you're going to certainly die in that day. Now, this is one of those things where... You know, you have the idea, you have the head knowledge, but you don't have experiential knowledge. Don't touch that. It's hot. Okay, you understand it's hot, but not until you touch it do you realize, holy jamoli, that's hot. I need to move my hand. So there's experiential and there's head knowledge. Adam here is given the understanding head knowledge, but not the experiential and that's what he's supposed to guard against. He's, spar both, he's supposed to guard against the enemy who's going to tempt him to make it experiential. 
that experiential knowledge is what's going to really get them in trouble. Let's go to 18. And Yov Elohim said, it's not good for man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. Okay, so we know, again, that when God uh, puts him in the garden, he's alone. Meaning, Eve is well, he's not alone. There's oneness. Eve is still inside him, right? Has not been separated yet. So, um, he's put there. And now, this naming the animals has to do with experiential versus head knowledge. The head knowledge is Adam's alone and he realizes it. He realizes it. And the Lord says, oh, it's not good that he's alone. He needs to have more. Understand, remember that the thought that Yove, okay, was one, is one, and yet separated the parts, the Holy Spirit and the living word, to come back to work as one, but so that those parts, right, the parts are pulled out to function together. Adam has one, just like the Lord pulled apart to function as one. Adam's going to need to pull out the Eve part to still function as one, but to not be alone. It's kind of like, but hopefully that's not too mind blowing. All right. Um, so we're going to come back after this and talk about that counterpart. Talk about the helper for him and talk about the naming of the animals. All right. So I will see you um, soon as we talk about and continue in chapter two. All right. See you soon. Bye.